just a quick review of the Kanban method, the change management principles. Start with what you do now, understanding current processes as they're actually practiced, respecting existing roles, responsibilities and job titles. Nobody gets a new identity. We'll be looking in depth at why this approach makes sense from a social psychology perspective. Gain agreement to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. In other words, from a social psychology perspective, we're pursuing incremental change rather than what's known as dramatic change. And incremental change comes a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It's not dramatic. And sometimes you'll deal with sponsors, with leaders who want that dramatic gesture, they want a, a, a big event happening, they want to be the hero manager, they want the success to stick to them, they want an obvious event that they sponsored that delivered a great victory so that they are the great hero that made it all happen. And that's really not the case with incremental change. Incremental change suits much better the humble leaders that Jim Collins identified in his book Good to Great. So if you have a leader who's not very humble, who really uh, wants to be in the limelight and take all the glory, it will not be so easy. You need to have agreement that you're pursuing incremental change. And encourage acts of leadership at all levels. If people are looking to someone else for the leadership, the leader becomes a bottleneck and waiting for someone else to show leadership causes delay. You're not moving quickly with agility in your organization. You're not reinventing yourself in short time frames. So our change management principles uh, primarily focused on the social psychology concept of incremental change and this democratization of leadership so that we can move uh, quickly and that people are uh, autonomous, that they feel that they have ownership of their situation. Then we have our service delivery principles, that your organization is a network of interdependent services. This is just a universal truth if you're in the intangible goods, knowledge, worker, professional services industry. In our business, the, the Movius Group businesses, Kanban University, David G. Anderson School of Management, these businesses are focused and scoped to the professional services, intangible goods industries. We do not teach management for physical goods, uh, 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 tangible, goods, uh, physical environment businesses. So understand and focus on your customers needs and expectations. Manage the work, let the workers organize around it. This is a key focus. Customers care about the work. They care about what they've requested. Let the workers who are smart, generally university educated people, let them figure out how to get it done. Focus on the work. Regularly review the network and its policies to improve outcomes. In other words, sim simple ideas like if it's taking too long, your customer's unhappy, where's the delay coming from? Review your network, identify the delay, do something about it, show some leadership. And often the leadership is as simple as changing a policy. Now, a little bit of detail on the Kanban method itself. As I was compiling the uh, Lessons in Agile Management book in 2012, looking back over 12 years of blog posts, actually even a little longer, 13 years of blog posts, uh, I was able to reflect on how did the Kanban method come about. Now I already knew that from the time of the Agile Management book in 2003, I had been looking for a different approach, an alternative path to agility. Don't take an Agile method and try and install it. Don't take a defined process 
and try and impose it on people. So eliminate dramatic social change, instead pursue incremental social change, an evolutionary approach. Start with what you do now and do something. Uh, identify your number one problem, do something about it. So, the, uh, I had the desire to pursue an evolutionary approach to change and the, the necessity to have a way of identifying what's your number one problem. And you'll be familiar with how I, I set about doing that adopting uh, ideas from the theory of constraints and that was documented in the Agile Management book. Find your bottleneck, do something about it, now look for the new bottleneck. Rinse and repeat. Well it turned out that by 2004 or 5 I had come to recognize that there's a lot of variability in professional services and knowledge work. And this week's bottleneck isn't necessarily the bottleneck next week. In fact, by 2006, when I was at Corbis, I'd sit with my staff meeting and I'd observe the analyst manager and the testing department manager arguing about who was the bigger bottleneck. Now, there can only be one bottleneck. And I came to realize that depending on the nature of the work coming through our department, and how it was flowing, analysis was at times a bottleneck and on other weeks it was testing. The bottleneck was moving around. We'd have to play whack-a-mole with the bottleneck. And instead it turned out that there's a better way of controlling that variability and the use of Kanban systems is used to do that in physical environments. So why not pursue the adoption of virtual Kanban systems? If we're doing intangible goods work, why not have intangible Kanban? So I started to use that. I started in 2005 and 6. we started to use Kanban systems, virtual Kanban systems, in software development and IT uh, organizations. So now we've got a WIP limit and we've got the desire to pursue evolutionary change. And it turned out that the use of Kanban systems, which was, uh, I was adopting those for a very specific reason, mechanical reasons, if you like. Scheduling, relief from overburdening, improved predictability, the whole concept that when we have a whip limit, we have a thin-tailed lead time distribution. And secondary effects that you relieve people of overburdening, they've got less multitasking, quality gets better. And if quality gets better, tickets don't circulate backwards so much. And that also helps to remove the tail from the distribution so we get more predictable. So we're using the whip limits here to relieve people of overburdening, improve predictability, improve quality, and the whole concept of a pool system and the triage on the front end of it as a way of scheduling based on cost of delay. It turns out that these whip limits are stressing. And the stressor of the whip limit catalyzes the need for improvement, the cartoon on the Kanban book, they're under some stress. They're, they're discussing it at the Kanban meeting and that's a feedback mechanism. It's a, it's a forum for discussing, we've got some stress in our environment, what's causing that stress? And then the third element in the formula, the fourth character in the cartoon says, let's do something about it, an act of leadership. So it turned out that the use of virtual Kanban systems, that provides the stressor. And really what we now call the Kanban method is defined by the Kanban cadences. And the Kanban cadences, they, uh, they provide the reflection mechanisms. So we've got some stress, we've got reflection mechanisms. All we need to do is sprinkle some leadership onto that and we've got evolutionary change in action. 
Now this diagram shows all of the Kanban cadences implemented at different maturity levels. This is from the new Kanban system improvement KMP2 class available for online delivery. Some of you may have seen this already. Some of you in the class may already be teaching this. These graphics were produced by Andreas Bartel. So this is showing all of the, the cadences and the idea that some of them are implemented at different levels of fidelity at different maturity levels. So the service delivery review, which is really a maturity level three uh, specific practice and behavior, manifests as something we're calling the flow review at maturity level two. It's a little bit more quantitative, uh, qualitative and and uh, more of a gut feel, it's not as formalized and there's not so much of a concept of a customer or meeting customer expectations. We're really just asking, are tickets flowing? Do they get blocked much? What are we doing about the blockers? At the very uh, lowest level, at maturity level one, the equivalent of the service delivery review is just a team retrospective, something that typical agile implementations Scrum with team retrospectives every two weeks. This is here. And as the maturity improves, we expect that to evolve into a flow review that involves multiple teams in a workflow cooperating together. And then ultimately a service delivery review. And a properly implemented service delivery review typically has the customers present to represent their side, to represent why they have expectations and to give feedback on whether they're happy or not, whether you're meeting their expectations. So we have uh, the service delivery review implemented at three different levels of fidelity. We have the replenishment meeting in introduced at three different levels of fidelity at maturity level one, two, and three. Uh, we have operations review implemented at two different levels of fidelity. And of course, all these practices are, are explained in detail in the Kanban Maturity Model book. Uh, 